an aspiring movie maker obsessed with the TV show Dexter makes his own slasher film. A dark and creepy script set stock with props from knives to blood. There was blood all over the table. Fascination with killers is a cornerstone of human psychology. The dark and horrific parts of human nature have a hold on our imaginations. What happens, though, when this curiosity about death turns into an unhealthy obsession? The worst case scenario? A serial killer is born. Life can imitate art, in this case, quite literally. An obsession with the strange psyche of American fan-favorite TV show character Dexter Morgan inspired a person to actually become Dexter. The harsh truth of the crime is the shocking reminder that it's best not to blur the lines between fantasy and reality, and that we need to keep our darkest imaginations separate from the real world. In today's bite-sized true crime episode, we examine the psyche of copycat killers, this one inspired by fiction rather than reality. Join us as we explore the dark journey of the Dexter wannabe in Copycat Killer, Mark Twitchell, the wannabe Dexter. Mark Andrew Twitchell, born July 4, 1979, spent his early life in Edmonton, Alberta, where gory crime, copycat killers, and a fascination with murder mysteries is surprisingly more common than in the rest of Canada. His interests, such as Star Wars, were typical to most geeks, but it was the TV character Dexter who he especially admired. The Canadians are known to be polite, calm, and law-abiding people, and Mark in his early teenage years was no different. However, as he grew older, his sinister thoughts began to reveal themselves. Indeed, while Twitchell, an amateur filmmaker, desired to make compelling art, no one had any idea what lengths he would go to in order to make his art truly lifelike. In his teenage years, Mark became obsessed with the anti-hero, delving into costume making and obsessing about what direction his career should take. All pretty ordinary, however, as expert psychologists point out, the makings of a killer are present if you look hard enough, and with hindsight, this is the case with Twitchell. In his early photos, Mark would stare hard at the cameras, not smiling. He was a self-described pathological liar and acknowledged that there was no circumstance in his childhood which made him the way he was. He was simply born this way. His first film, Star Wars Secrets of the Rebellion, did garner some buzz around the local area. However, he certainly didn't make it big at any box office. His second film, House of Cards, also didn't do that well. Perhaps it was this lack of acknowledgement of his work that caused him to snap. There is no telling what switch flips to make someone into a serial killer. However, the case of Mark Twitchell does give us some hints. In 2008, Twitchell changed direction, moving from producing sci-fi movies to instead renting a garage to film a horror movie. The garage was tucked away in the south of Edmonton, and Twitchell had booked it for purposes more hideous than the artistic whims of a man who makes movies. His obsession with Dexter Morgan, a television character who serves as a forensic bloodstain pattern analyst for the fictional Miami Metro Police Department, was well known to Twitchell's friends and family. He was fixated with the moral dilemmas faced by the character who helped the police by day and killed hardened criminals by night. Increasingly obsessed with this character, Twitchell decided to cross the line that exists between reality and fiction and take on the mantle of becoming the real-life Dexter. The murder started in the garage when an unsuspecting Gilles Thoreau, 26, walked into the premises thinking he was there for a date with a woman he'd met on PlentyOfFish.com. Of course, there was no woman, only Twitchell catfishing the poor Gilles, luring him to his garage to make him into an art piece. Twitchell, using the profile of an attractive blonde called Sheena, 24, had given poor Gilles very specific instructions about how to get to the site. Gilles Thoreau, then a security guard, didn't think anything was amiss. He had no inkling he was being catfished, let alone led to a murder trap. As soon as he entered the premises, however, he was hit from behind with a stun baton. The man who tackled him, Mark Twitchell, took out a gun. He ordered Thoreau to get down on his stomach on the floor, put his arms behind his back, and close his eyes. When Thoreau complied with this order, Twitchell started to inch closer to him, getting ready to handcuff the unfortunate and naive Thoreau. Pumped with adrenaline, Thoreau decided he wasn't going down without a fight. He knew he was going to die if he didn't act. The metal jingle of handcuffs was coming closer and closer. In a commendable act of bravery, he grabbed the end of the gun. It was plastic, and that emboldened him to make a run for his life. His attacker pursued him, hitting him with a stun baton. A couple of dog walkers passing by interfered with the murder ploy, and Thoreau got away. He later reported feeling ashamed about being lured into the attack and didn't report the incident to the police. The next man who got taken in by the fictional Sheena wasn't so lucky. John Bryan Johnny Altinger, 38, worked as a computer contractor at an oil field equipment manufacturer when he suddenly went missing. A few days later, Altinger's friends noticed they hadn't seen him in a while, and texts and calls to his phone were unanswered. 
Before disappearing, he had told his friends that he was meeting a woman he'd met online at the plentyoffish.com website. Altinger's boss received a resignation letter out of the blue, but nobody replied to his emails requesting an address to send Altinger's final paycheck. Friends eventually received a very suspicious email, where Altinger told them of the mystery woman he had just met with whom he was going to Costa Rica. However, several days passed and nobody saw or heard from Altinger. Worried, friends joined together to break into Altinger's apartment, where they found nothing to suggest that he had packed up to go on vacation. Dirty dishes were still in the sink, and his passport was found. Something was definitely amiss. Sheena, the woman with whom Altinger matched on PlentyOfFish.com, was involved, and the police were called. Upon initial inquiry, no physical record of anyone named Sheena was found that matched the profile on PlentyOfFish.com. Soon enough, a homicide investigation was launched by the police. The investigation led police to the garage from which Gilles Thoreau had escaped with his life just a month prior. Forensic teams discovered copious amounts of human blood on the floor of the garage, but what broke the camel's back was the document police found in Twitchell's garage. Vanity and selfishness are classic killer traits that Twitchell himself recorded in a tell-all document titled Profile of a Psychopath. He recorded his crimes in acute detail in this document, which landed him a one-way cell in prison for life. The documentation of crime, especially to relive the fantasy of committing murder, is what gets many murderers caught. Despite professions of innocence, Twitchell's laptop uncovered a key piece of evidence, a document titled Confessions of a Serial Killer, which read, this story is based on true events. The names and events were altered slightly to protect the guilty. This is the story of my progression into becoming a serial killer. Police found details of months of planning, Twitchell's strained relationship with his wife, and a blow-by-blow -blow record of his attack on Tarot. He recorded the full details of how he lured Altinger to the garage. The detailed account of the murder recorded the dismemberment of his body. Chillingly, he noted that he was laughing while cutting Altinger open after killing him. Police were able to locate Altinger's remains and his blood in Twitchell's trunk using the information from the document. The frenzy around this case grew due to many unexpected details. A serial killer who records his every move on paper with the intent to monetize the story is unheard of. A cinematographer who, under the guise of filming a horror story, actually commits murder. The details of the House of Cards were eerily similar to the two men's attacks. A man in a hockey mask lures unsuspecting men into a garage using a dating site to catfish them. During his trial, Twitchell admitted that Altinger was dead and that he had been responsible. He contested the first-degree murder charge by saying that he wanted the film to be as realistic as possible and so had requested Altinger to act along. Altinger refused and a fight ensued. Twitchell said that the blow-by-blow -blow account in the document the police found was a fictionalized version of events. His version of events was that he'd struck Altinger on the head with a pipe after Altinger attacked him in an attempt to escape. He then stabbed him repeatedly to defend himself. Twitchell panicked when he realized what he'd done and attempted to discard the body and sent fake emails to everyone. He said he had dramatized it for the shock value to ensure the story became an urban legend. He also said he had intended to let the men go to garner attention about the incident in the area. About the notes he'd made in the document, he said that he had attempted to curate a compelling and convincing killer psychology so that his story sells. The attempted murder charge for the attack on Gilles Thoreau was stayed on June 17, 2011. Since the charge wasn't going to add weight to the first-degree murder conviction, Gilles decided not to pursue the case. Mark Twitchell was convicted of first-degree murder with parole after 25 years. To prevent the jury from being influenced by the sensationalism surrounding this case, publicity stays were imposed on information not yet released to the public. As soon as the publicity bans were lifted, CBS and NBC, among countless other media houses, sat in and reported on the trial. While journalist and true crime author Steve Lubin was in direct contact with Twitchell for information about a true crime book. Though he used the frenzy around his case to appeal his murder conviction, arguing that the right to a fair trial had been compromised, Twitchell seems to be enjoying the notoriety. In conversations with Steve, rambling on and on about his proclivities and why he did what he did. His nonchalant answer to one such question was, It is what it is, I am who I am. One would think he'd forego his Dexter obsession, but he continues to watch the show in prison. But even if Twitchell is enjoying his time in jail, the wannabe Dexter is sure to spend the rest of his life behind bars.